On this episode of Road Dirt, we sit down for a chat with our friend Neil Bailey and talk about his motorcycling life. Stay tuned. Hey, this is Rob Brooks and Neil Bailey with Road Dirt, and um, we're sitting in the Road Dirt garage, and Neil has come down from Charlotte, North Carolina to hang out with us for the weekend. Man, it is a pleasure to have you, my friend. It's a long journey from Charlotte. I had to pack my sandwiches, my (laughs) overnight bag, (laughs) and fight traffic all the way down here on a Friday when he came down. The old mule's not so fast anymore. (laughs) With the, the car or you? Which old meal you talking about? Yeah, both of them, right. Which old meal you talking about? So, um, yeah, Neil's in town here for the weekend. We thought we'd shoot just a little conversation in the, in here. We're going to ride a couple of bikes and um, and just hang out for the weekend. It's going to be good. So, Neil, I just it thrills me that you're here. And and also, we actually met last year for the first time at the Barber Round, Barber Motorsports Round of the Moto America Series. Which is actually happening this weekend. That's right, yeah. They had to move it up a weekend. They can't. It's not the season closer for Moto America anymore, yeah. but um, it's going on. As as of this shooting, they are racing at Barber, and we're not there. That's okay. We're here. That's why we're here. Yeah, we have a job to do this weekend. Right? Okay, yeah. That's what I've got a job to do. So I've got to be reminded of that. But it's a thrill to have Neil. I, Neil, I've been reading, like a lot of you have, I, I've been reading Neil's writings for a lot of years. I um, knew someone was reading it. They, yeah, we're, we're one of two or three people that, kind of like Ted Edwards says, you know, two, two of his, 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 uh, his fans, you know, his only fan. And um, so it's one of these things where I've always wanted to meet you, ever since I've been reading you, late 90s, early into the 2000s. And, uh, and then we got acquainted, I guess, through social media last year. We started interacting some, and then... We are able to work with you in publishing three of the stories on the on his trip to Ukraine, which was a, a big a, a big honor for us. And then we met up and you know ate some Mexican and broke some chips together at Barber. And that's how it happens, and, right? I know, you know. And um, so it's it's a real thrill to not only have you here hanging out with us for a weekend, but uh, have you contributing and collaborating with us at Road Dirt. We're starting a series called Neil Bailey Rides. That uh, Neil is going to be a monthly columnist for the, you know, for the for our online Road Dirt dot TV publication, and um, so this is a thrill getting to, getting to have you here. Neil has written you've written all over the world. You, the stories you've shared with me, you know, in the time we've gotten to know each other, and then hanging out this weekend are just remarkable, man. I, I almost feel like Neil's such a great writer, as well as a writer that. Um, I almost feel like I've lived vicariously through some of the stories you've told, the places you've been in the world. And um, Well, thank you. Um, yeah, I started writing, uh, I started on a moped when I was 16. Oh, yeah, okay. Then we had a, we were allowed up to a 250cc when we were 17. We had to pass our test. My first bike was an XT500. Now, where'd you grow up at? You were from? Southern England. What's the name of the town? Uh, it's called Tor Bay is the Tor bay, bay that I'm from. So okay, right you, on the coast. Some people might know Torquay from Faulty Towers with John Cleese. It was the crazy show about Basil Faulty, the hotel owner. And mm. the good number of people remember that crazy show. So, so that's I, where you grew up. Cool. Yeah, so I grew up in a seaside town that was very much bed and breakfast hotels during the summer and then of course in the winter there was nothing. So it was a town with no industry. You know, yeah. I grew up in a time period of most I think when we had mass unemployment and mm. it hit regional areas really hard. So we kind of grew up in a very scrappy lifestyle. I mean, yeah. we didn't have cars, we didn't have jobs. I mean, but we always had this desire to ride motorcycles and somehow we kept our motorcycles on the road. And that just piled to a career riding motorcycles around the world, coming to America. And then, you know, really becoming a journalist came out of the need where I just, I was sitting there looking at the lights of Africa one night after a very long trip around Europe. And I said, you know, someone needs to pay me to do this. <laughs> yeah, like, exactly. It's great when you come back to the pub and you've got your pictures. Oh, that's a great story. And you know, that's really cool. But you got no money for another beer. And it's like, <laughs> maybe someone should pay me to do this. And that's what really fueled my journalism career. Yeah. And the first story he told that we, we published is called Addiction. Mm. And it's about, it's really the story of that Laverda, isn't it? Yeah, so... I thought that was your first bike, but apparently... Because no, I was no, thinking, no. as I'm reading this, I'm going, his a Laverda 1200 was his first bike, but no, it wasn't, yeah. Well, you know, back in the day, you know, 
we were restricted to 250 cc motorcycle as kids until you yeah, had yeah. a license hmm. and so there was always a hierarchy of you know the men rode triumphs and bsa's and then kawasaki started to come and yamaha's and hondas and you worked your way up the chain so by yeah. the time i got to laverdo i'd been through um a 250 a 125 um the 500, the 500 and Motoguzzi 850 and then Laverda. So it was kind of like this ascension. So I felt, you know, at, at that point in life, you feel like you've arrived. You have a 1200cc yeah. triple. And of course, it was a big, fast bike in the day. Now oh, yeah. it's an old vintage bike. And but you still own it. Well, I still own the pieces. Uh, it's, in, <laughs> it's in boxes. <laughs> right? yeah, it's been in boxes. Yeah. Well, being a worthless mechanic, I was. I managed to take it apart. I couldn't get it back yeah. together again. You know? That's the story of my life right there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's thing. me, man. <laughs> so, yeah. So, it's been a very long... You know, it's basically, it's been about 45 years on two wheels and 23 yeah. years as a professional journalist in this space. And obviously, super excited to come up and connect with you guys. Because this is to me how this is life works. You know, we yeah. bump into each other, and then we see each other at barber, and then now we're going to do some collaborations and stories together. So I'm, yeah. I'm very excited for that. Uh, we are too. You um you've traveled um man some of you've been on just on every continent that you can ride on just about. I think you've you've had the opportunity to to go there. Um, and you were recently in in Ukraine, and mm -hmm. um, how did that experience in Riding Ukraine, you and Kieran Ridley. How did that? Um, how did that come about? Well, it actually came about because of my Laverda. Yeah. So, I decided I would write one of the stories that um, about the old Laverda with a, a goal to putting a documentary together about it. So it's mm -hmm. kind of one of the things I'm in process of. And somehow that story found its way to an old friend of mine, Simon. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't seen Simon for twenty six years. I had been riding around Europe in 1996 and I'd gone through Bucharest in Romania and Simon was running some casinos for a Turkish gangster out of Istanbul and ended up getting kidnapped by the Russians and he was having this whole wild life and I stopped in Bucharest to see him and then I left and I didn't see him again for 26 years Wow! and I had no idea where he was I had bits of information you know and uh, had no idea. Then that Laverda story went on a Facebook page that went to an old friend I hadn't seen since 1984. He sends it to Simon. Simon contacts me. He says, sees that I do television and video and says, hey, I'm running a photography exhibition in the Middle East. Would you come and be the interviewer for me? Because I don't like the style of the people that are doing the interviews. Hmm. And lo and behold, I'm off to the Middle East interviewing the world's top photographers, right? Yeah. <laughs> As you do. And while I was there, I interviewed a gentleman by the name of Kieran Ridley. And oh, so that's where you met Kieran. Okay. Correct. Right. So in 2022, when we were at there, there's a lot of conflict journalists there. You know, James Nackoy was there, um, Paula Bronstein. Um, you know, a lot of the people that are covering war and conflict and have highly living from the Washington Post. So Russia was sort of, you know, amassing troops on the Ukrainian border during the time we were there in 2022. So all the conversation of dinner and stuff was about what was going on and Kieran left and I left and as soon as I got back to America the war kicked off and then one night Kieran called me from Ukraine as I wrote about in the story and he was riding a cheap Chinese motorcycle to cover the, um, the refugees who were trying to evacuate through to Poland hmm. and there was literally 30 mile lines of refugees trying wow. to get out and he couldn't get by in a car yeah even and fixes are very expensive in Ukraine hmm. You, know, you buy a fixer for translation and keeping you safe and everything. And so he bought this cheap Chinese motorcycle so he could get past the lines of refugees. And then he was able to tell the stories. And also he realized it started giving this different type of access to what was going on because he, I don't know, maybe like you're a little disarmed when you arrive on a motorcycle, you're a bit more vulnerable. Yeah. And uh, suddenly the line went dead and he told me he was safe. He told me he had a way out because at that point, nobody knew if the Russians were coming through Belarus into Western Ukraine. It was not known that it was going to be a safe place. So for two or three days, I just was sweating it out, waiting to hear what happened to him. And he popped up in Poland and he was okay and he got out. And I just said, Hey, I got to come help you do something here. I need to, I need to shed some light on the stories of these journalists that are working mm -hmm. inside. I mean, he had a young wife at home with twins. I mean, his life's at risk. And 
Yeah, and yeah, he's telling his story. Yeah, right. And I thought I've got to shed some light on that, and I've got to help the people that are there. So I put a call in to BMW, and we got some bikes teed up in uh, in Munich, and then put some sponsors together. And it was a very, it was now looking back, you you sort of tell the story in a condensed format, but it was quite a, you know, it was quite a lengthy period that you you have to get bulletproof vests with really high caliber protection mm -hmm. and because there's a big run on bulletproof vests the war's broken out so you've got to order it and wait and then you need international press passes then you need Ukrainian military authority to be able to go cover this stuff and mm -hmm. and then quite by chance a um, doctor friend of mine suggested I went and did combat lifesaver training mm. so I became the first civilian to go through a military program on combat lifesaver training and it's not medicine it is how to keep somebody alive if they've lost a limb got a bullet hole not breathing got a collapsed lung or they've been burnt or broken bones it's just what to do to a human to get them to a medic yeah so I did a week wow. of training with the military to learn and then they gave me they were really kind they gave me a big bag of tourniquets and you know hemostatic bandages for bullet wounds so I had this big bag of stuff should we need to keep someone alive long enough to get them to a hospital so that's when that's when the shit gets real, you know. And yeah, then, for real. So then there was a series of things. Kieran got COVID, I got COVID, I crashed a bicycle. <laughs> Post pump, <laughs> yeah. You know, this and this. So finally we end up, flew to Paris, trained to Munich, got the bike, went down through um, Europe, and then we spent three weeks riding inside Ukraine. Yeah. And I think we covered about 3,000 miles. And we worked with some fixes in Lviv. So Kieran really had a mind to want to sort of do the stories, not just the frontline stuff that we mm. see every day. And that was why a lot of the stories that we did were amputees, refugees, children's hospital, children's hospital. Yeah, yeah. A yeah. lot of the stuff that's maybe not as mainstream. And yet, it's it's really it was more of what was happening with the people in Ukraine. What's happening behind yeah. the scenes? You know, yeah. that that that's behind the camera, so to speak. And, and I um, think what doesn't get translated, you know, when you see the tragedy, and you see a lot of the drama, and you know, is the resolve of the people, you know, mm. when you walk into a situation where it's still on fire, you know, from missile strikes, and everybody's just cleaning up. They're still digging out through, out of the rumble, up through the oh, rubble. Yeah, yeah, no one's complaining. Everyone's just rolling up their sleeves, and there's almost like this huge energy to put things back as good as it can be as quick as possible. And I think it's really, you know, like a coping mechanism. Hey, you can do what you want to, so you're not going to break our spirit. And that yeah. was very much what we felt. I think that came across in your stories well, too, you, because yeah. um, uh, you can look them up on the site roaddirt.tv. They're three three part series called "An Englishman in Ukraine," and um, man, I almost felt like I was walking it with you. Well, thank you as you were sharing true. those. So I think you it's and Carol as a writer to try and bring people in. So. Yeah, draw them in and help them experience in their minds some of what you experienced on the ground. And you mm. and Karen did a great job of that. Yeah. So um, now you have a you have a foundation also. Um, well, it's a uh, Wellspring International Outreach. Wellspring International Outreach. And, yeah, I started um, about fifteen years. Yeah, ago. tell me a little bit about that. That's okay. a great organization. We well, love yeah. supporting it, by the way. It's a motorcycle story. Yeah, essentially it is, yeah. So in 19, um, 1995, um, in 88 I was going to ride it, uh, our ATGS to, to Brazil and I put a big trip together and I broke my spine. So by 1995 I'm working in a motorcycle shop and um, you're hanging out with a group of yahoos and wild guys and I said, come on, let's, let's go to South America. So we bought a bunch of uh, Kawasaki 550s. We bought, I think we ended up buying five, and there was oh, two, wow. two KZs, two GPZs, and one wreck, and we put four <laughs> bikes together, and mine was quite good. Mine was actually running, I paid three Yeah, so you weren't, on, you weren't on the wreck? Well, they were working on that. I'm not a okay. good enough mechanic. I mean, I was able to do this. I'm able to do the small things. So right. we, we put MT60 Pirelli dirt tires. We raised the mud guard so that, you know, drilled holes and raised them so the mud got in there. We actually took the seat covers off and put more foam in them. For some reason, this was this was ADV riding in its best yeah, in its in its infancy. In its infancy, you know. And then we we shipped these four bikes to Guatemala. Mm -hmm. with no internet, so you're on the phone and you you know you're phone booths and yeah. And we get and then we we put a big bag of spares together. So the one good thing was most of the spares would have been communal chain links, carburetor bodies, you know, coils. Yeah. And Ron, my buddy that won this, is a factory drain Kawasaki mechanic, which is useful. So he knew the right tools to take. Cool. And we get to Guatemala and we unload these bikes. And six weeks later, we're in Peru. 
and we've gone six thousand miles, nine countries. Wow! And um, that's some riding, man. That was kind of and then one day, I this hairy looking mongrel comes up the road on a little dirt bike and yells out, and I yell out, and we kind of both fell afterwards of our destiny to meet. It was Father Giovanni, who was a Canadian priest, riding around Peru on a little Honda XL 185. Wow. And I was not a storyteller, journalist, or a you know, photographer, videographer, anything then. And what I realize now is, over the time I spent with Father Giovanna, Giovanni, he downloaded his life story to me. And I could tell you it verbatim today. He didn't do it with the other guys, it was me. And was, I he guess just, because I'm a storyteller. And this amazing story of you know, being Canadian and his family disowning him for being a priest and how he came to be a priest and working in the poorest places in Newfoundland and then in Peru and all the projects. And, and I think that was such, such a huge, big you know, life change to me yeah. because it, it reawakened that I wanted to do something for humanity. And it really wasn't until probably about another 10 or 12 years that I started Wellspring. Mm. But I think that seed with was Geo planted with, with him. Put me on a different path. I came yeah. home, quit my job, went to Europe, started writing, journaling, and then that was when I had that big decision, I need to get paid for this. And as soon as I was up and running and making enough money, I was straight to Peru and started working in the orphanage. And then it was an orphanage that Father Giovanni had supported, and then mm. he, he passed away, unfortunately, in a car mm. wreck. So he was really the catalyst for Wellspring, but it wouldn't happen without a motorcycle trip. So without you get on on a pair of bikes, how you guys met on yeah. a dirt road, yeah. and you just happened to run twelve thousand feet in the Andes Mountains, <laughs> you know, days from anywhere. Yeah, I know it. Yeah, that, that's an that's an amazing inter intersection. Yeah, but my sure. whole life's like been like that. Like Intersections. My, yeah, my life, life is like that. My life changes in a second. I see someone and I'm. You know, these swirl. <laughs> oh, <laughs> new, this, new direction. <laughs> this is something interesting. Yeah. So, so motorcycles, always, always, always motorcycles. I mean, that's why we're here now. It's what we're going to be doing this weekend. It's all yeah, the future yeah. projects we do because of motorcycles. You know? So, what have you got? What What have you got? Um, what irons have you got in the fire right now? The things that uh, you're working on that you're you got hopes and dreams for in the coming year or two. I always have a dozen. Or half a dozen movies, books, stories, documentaries just going in your head. in your head, right? Yeah, it's just the, the regular nonsense that goes on. <laughs> um, I think the big push is I'm going to go back to Ukraine in mid July. Oh yeah, and um, I'm not quite sure how it's going to come about. Mm -hmm. So I'm just moving things and posturing things. I just did a big story about my friend Anna, who's in Ukraine. I'm waiting for it to publish, and I want to use some media for that. Um, still continuing to fundraise mm -hmm. um, for the kids and for different projects, and then really just sort of in a waiting mode to see how this Ukraine trip shapes up. I'm not 100% sure how it's going to go. I just know I need to be there. Yeah. And I will be there. Is I, Karen going back? He's going to make I sure? I don't know. It's a very okay. good point. He, um, yeah. He's got some... Uh, you know, he's first, such a phenomenal photographer with your storytelling. Yeah, well, he won a Pulitzer Scala World Award. Yeah. And he's exhibiting again May 18th, um, I think, for the... the National, not National Geographic, the Royal Geographic Society in England, and he's doing a talk about his images. So you guys are a great team. I hope you can work it out. Yeah, and at a certain point in time, you know, there's a lot of stuff that we didn't process from Ukraine. Like, okay, Kieran shot a war, world award-winning images, and so there's a situation that, in my mind, like you, know, you look on the wall and you see an image, a shot by a photographer that's a, it's won a, a prize or a gala award. You know, maybe you might be lucky enough to hear the photographer talk about the image. But it's a snapshot. It's a, like a piece of a jigsaw puzzle in the world, isn't it? You're not seeing yeah. it. And Even his little description is just a thumbnail. And what's really unique basically. about it is if you, I take his award-winning images. I shot B-roll video of him shooting them. I've got pictures of the area. Mm -hmm. So I can build a whole composite around each picture of how it was taken, where it was taken, what the situation was Give it context. Like, which I think and give quite, it a backstory. Which I think is very rare. I've yeah. never seen that done. I mean, I'm sure it has been done. It's not often an award-winning photographer happens to have another photographer and, and somebody can shoot video and tell a story with him because he had no concept he was going to win an award when we did it. He was just doing it. Just shoot it, right. So that I would really like to do. Yeah. Um, you know, working on various video series, more stories. So, yeah. It's, that's what. That's one of the things. We don't run out of stories, right? We don't run out of stories. <laughs> and we've been talking about just how, you know, relationships are everything. And secondly, stories are everything. You know, we live in we live in such an information overload world that getting to do what we do, you know, is just it's a privilege. Sh it is share stories with people because stories stick with you more than information. Information fills your head. Stories move your soul. 
Well, one thing I've always been really, really uh, happy about being a journalist inside the motorcycle space, we do not create stories to create argument. Right. Or to prove a point against another point. I mean, what we do is, you know, you go on, you go on tour and you take a trip. Yeah, sure, you want people to go, so you don't want to tell them about all the crappy times, but, you know, we're really just reporting on what's there and what's happening mm. and how bikes are and what they're doing. I think and how we're, what we're experiencing in it. Well, right. We're, we're really lucky. We're not trying to manipulate someone to dislike another set of people or, you know, create yeah. an argument with what we're doing. We're just, and that's what's so beautiful about the motorcycle industry. And it doesn't matter, you know, whether you're at a Harley or a Honda or you ride a Triumph or a BMW. I mean, we're all motorcyclists across in the same genre. Mm -hmm. And we're all, and, and humans have been telling stories since the dawn of time. And the stories we tell, at least, you know, they're real. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're us, they're who we are, they're what we do and how we perceive the world. And you either like it or you don't. True. But you can't say it's wrong or right. And I really like that. Yeah. How can folks get in touch with you and keep up with what you're doing? I'm just, I mean, best thing is just come through Road Dirt, right? Check us out on Road Dirt. The man is the man is part of the the Road Dirt crew. So yeah, that's an honor. To, it's not a good thing for you. You're missing <laughs> to that in public. Right? I think it's, I, I think we'll uh, let you hang around for a bit. I yeah, I can just see the video now where Road Dirt began to fail. Right? It'll all be down to this video. <laughs> this will be the day, right? It ain't it, man. But um, yeah, so uh, well, uh, well, the the website Wellspring Dash Outreach. Well, make sure you put the dash in there. Wellspring Dash Outreach dot org, right? Yeah, o r g. And there's a donation o -R -G. button there. We're five one c three tax deductible donations, and of course the money will go to Ukraine. We do have other projects still in Peru. Yeah, yeah. And um, Father we, Gio's uh, orphanage, right? Yeah, and you know what, Sister uh, Giovanna and um, Fabiola, Josefina, the three nuns that run the place. I mean, mm -hmm. just lovely ladies. And uh, for those of you who follow me on my social media and videos over the years, you'll, you'll be familiar with them. As soon as the war broke out, they saw on social media that I was going to Ukraine. They called me, said, listen, stop sending this money, everything to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Wow. We'll manage. That's a heart. That got yeah, hard. yeah, that's what, and those ladies are amazing. And I will go back. I mean, it's in my goal to go back. Oh, yeah. You know, you're talking about ladies that work seven days a week for these kids. Yeah. And they, they do it with kindness and love and joy. And when I go there, I mean, I know a lot of people probably find this hard to believe. I mean, I, those ladies are probably some of my greatest friends. They are so much fun to hang out with. Yeah. And when you see the work they do, I mean, it's very, very humbling. Yeah. The commitment that they have to those kids and how they keep them alive, it's just, it's unbelievable. So that's, it's such a privilege for me to go see them. And when they call you up and say, look, don't send us any money because Ukraine needs it. That, that's, uh, that's, that's just a beautiful heart. That, right it is beautiful heart. So you can find them on social media. Just look for Neil Bailey or Neil Bailey Rides. Got a YouTube channel, Neil Bailey Rides. Yeah. There's a, there's a bunch of videos on there too. Yeah, and then a lot of obviously videos. we'll be doing some cool things, and we'll be doing some cool things here on, in the in the years to come. So Neil, it's a pleasure, man. Good to have you here. Thank you much, and uh, look we're about forward to, to more adventures. We're about to go ride. This is Rob and Neil with Road Dirt, Ride Life. <laughs>